You're watching Medfield TV Community Shows. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and, uh, and all the way with LBJ. I mean, today we're going to talk about 50 years ago, 50 years ago, this, this coming November, 50 years ago, you know, the election of 1968, and what a doozy. The election year in and of itself, of the entire year, was a doozy, wasn't it? And one could, one could spend a, one could do a five or a six hour present, a five, five or six hour session on just the very year 1968. And, and cover five or six, or thank you, five or six or, or, or seven individual topics. Today, today we're going to the very end of the year, November of 1968, and our conversation is, will be Lyndon Johnson, obviously, uh, Hubert Humphrey, we'll, we're going to bring him in, uh, Gene McCarthy, uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, the anti-war movement, and we're going to bring Pegasus, Pegasus into the conversation. And Pegasus was uh, nominated for president by the anti-war movement uh, when the anti-war movement followed Hubert Humphrey in Chicago in 1968. So we have a lot to do. So put on your seatbelt and listen fast. I always like to say that to students sometimes. It gets them confused. Listen fast. What do you mean listen fast? I never. I never ask that. I like to massage the material. I'd rather get half of, half of getting done what I want to get done to make sure that it gets done and it all is connected up. So let's begin. And this topic, this topic stands alone, as you know, that, you know, let's begin with the impact of the Tet Offensive, you know, on the Johnson decision not to seek re-election in 1968. That was huge. And, with, and we don't have the time you know, to be able to, you know, to dive into all of those details. You know, but the Tet Offensive, January was the 50th anniversary of the Tet Offensive, and I'm saying T-E-T, -E you know, the Chinese New Year, and it caught the entire country, both at home and in South Vietnam, by surprise, allegedly. And what it did do, however, is that it destroyed any credibility, any credibility that Johnson had left you know, that we've turned the corner in Vietnam, you know, that we're making progress. And it's not that the press reported Tet as a victory for the Viet Cong. It was not. They were wiped out. They were totally destroyed by, by American firepower. But what the press asked, and they asked a good and necessary question, if we're winning this war, I'm using that in a, in a very generic way, if we're winning, if we've turned the corner, if we're making progress, no one ever said, well, the press said, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Well, certainly, uh, General of the Army William Westmoreland never said that. But if we're making progress, how can the enemy attack the length and breadth of South Vietnam? How can this happen? And from that will come the credibility gap of, of, of Lyndon Johnson. You've been lying all these years. Not only have you been lying, but every administration says Harry Truman's been lying. And there's no road home to victory, unlike World War II. There's the, the, road to, the road to victory in World War II you know, was through Tokyo, through Berlin, through Rome. At least in Korea, you know, the road to victory was to move up to that 38th parallel and to contain the North Koreans from any uh, farther advance along the Korean Peninsula. So, in a very short period of time, four years, in 1964, and when, when, Lyndon, when Lyndon Johnson won an historic victory all the way with LBJ, remember that? I know you do, and all of us, all the way with LBJ. And now just four years later, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids have you killed today? Vietnamese children, air attacks, napalm, and so forth, and American soldiers. Young men, 18, 19, 20, so young, so brave, and in 1968, so dead. It was the deadliest year in Vietnam for the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army and Air Force and Navy. Over 15,000 
American soldiers, airmen, and so forth, died in 1968. Uh, the anti-war movement was at the very top of its voice. And in February of 1968, Gene McCarthy, uh, nobody from nowhere, I mean, Gene McCarthy from Minnesota. Anybody here from Minnesota? All right, okay, then I, I can diss Minnesota. Or, I mean, who? You, you, nobody lives in Minnesota. It's a flyover state. And, and Gene McCarthy into New Hampshire to challenge a sitting wartime president for the nomination of the Democratic Party. And, and Gene McCarthy, uh, what he did to, for the anti-war movement, certainly among young women and young men, he gave the anti-war movement, if you will, an adult voice, a senator a senator who was able to take on a sitting wartime president and go into New Hampshire and these young, many of these young women went with him, didn't they? Clean for Gene. They put on a dress, a little heel, a little makeup and a bra and they were clean for Gene. The guys cut their hair, put on a suit, penny loafers, maybe wingtips. I have wingtips on today. And they were clean for Gene and Gene McCarthy captured 42% of the popular vote in New Hampshire. This is against a sitting wartime president with all the resources of the President of the United States. And, and it, was seen as a, it was seen as a victory, if you will, you know, for the anti-war movement. For Lyndon Johnson, it's the end of the road. Because I know Bobby Kennedy is going to declare shortly. And I loathe Bobby Kennedy. I loathe him and he loathes me. And there was no way Lyndon Johnson, you know, with the eagle, big, an ego bigger than the size of the state of Texas, could ever bear to be defeated or almost defeated by Bobby Kennedy in an upcoming primary in the spring. So in March of 1968, Lyndon Johnson got on the three major networks. There were only three back then. Not bad, huh? And everybody went to bed at 11.15, didn't they? The news was over, the American flag came up, they played the Star Spangled Banner, and they asked a very important question, a question that ought to be asked every night. Do you know where your children are? Remember that? Do you know where your children are? And that is an important question even more so today than it was 50 years ago. And Lyndon Johnson, in the last Sunday in March of 1968, stunned the country, stunned the party, that I will not seek, nor will I accept the nomination of my party for a second term as your president. That's closing both doors, slamming them shut. I will not seek, nor will I accept. And it will be Lady Bird, who was in the Oval Office off camera, and the daughters off camera, right before airtime, when that light was about to go from red to green, and by the way, that does happen. Um, you know I do a little cable. and uh, you, you get a countdown, and you know you're going live in three seconds, and I've done it a thousand times, and even with that, I go bingo. I can feel my stomach just flip a little bit. Here we go, live, without any delay, and it's me and the camera, and four neighborhoods, four communities. Lady Bird, right before the red went green, you know, checked the last line of Lyndon Johnson's speech, and she said, Lyndon, I want to add in, and she wrote it in, and not, you will not accept the nomination. We are going home to Texas, where people care when you're sick, and they know when you die. You, can, you will not survive another term. You're drinking too much, and he was, he likes scotch, which is, this is a great afternoon for scotch. <laughs> you know, this, 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 is, this is a scotch afternoon. It may be an acquired taste, but nonetheless, this is a scotch afternoon. I think I'm talking myself into something. The, you're smoking too much, and he was, and, and you can't sleep, and he could not. And we're going home. Lyndon, Lyndon, you're, you're almost 64. No Johnson man has ever lived beyond the age of 65. They've all gone down with a massive coronary. This job will kill you if you're reelected. You will not seek, nor will you accept. 
and Johnson removed himself to retire. LBJ, the great LBJ, and LBJ never wanted to be a war president, and I'll just say this and leave it, that without the war, Lyndon Johnson will be today remembered as one of the near great American presidents. He'd be up there with Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and one of our favorites, Skid and Hell Harry, you know, a true man from Independence, Missouri. The war, the war destro destroyed the presidential historic reputation of Lyndon Johnson. He wanted to be remembered for the great society, giving gifts to the American people. But it didn't, it didn't go that way, did it? I mean, the war came, and, and, and the war ruined everything. And we ought to take a moment and just, if you have a Medicare card with you, thank you, LBJ. If you, if you hike the Appalachian Trail, anybody here hike the Appalachian Trail? I'm going to someday. Thank you, LBJ. Thank you, LBJ. If you, if you swim in the Charles River, thank you, LBJ. It's the cleanest urban river in, in the United States. If you, if you listen to NPR radio, which is getting a little too lefty for me, but that's an editorial comment. I mean, if you listen to NPR radio or you watch Channel 2, thank you, Lyndon Johnson. The war has blurred so much of that. So Johnson retires, Kennedy's in, and we're off to the convention. We're moving quickly, aren't we? We're off to the convention in the summer, in, in August of 1968. We're off to the Democratic National Convention. The Republicans had already, they had already conducted their convention earlier in Miami. Let's do the Republican convention first, because let's maintain the chronological order. We know, and this is going to frame, this is going to frame the election in many ways, that the, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago led to a police riot, didn't it? I mean, it, it led to a Gestapo-like tactics uh, on the part of the Chicago police. Now, that convention occurred after the Republican convention, and Richard Nixon, safely nominated and, and running with Spiro Agnew, you know, who would do the dirty work for him, to punch below the belt, just as Nixon had punch below the belt for Dwight Eisenhower in 52 and again in 50 and again in 56 that Nixon offering himself to the country as the new Nixon I matured uh, defeats in 1960 to John Kennedy and defeat in 1962 to Governor Brown and his son is now the governor of California have matured me have seasoned me I've traveled I've thought I've read I'm a new Nixon and I'm prepared to bring this country together and the point I want to make here, and then we'll go to Chicago, and then come back to the election, is that Richard Nixon, in watching the, the Chicago Convention, not only were there riots in the streets, there was all sorts of tumult and, and pushing and shoving and yelling on the floor of the convention, you know, over whether or not we should include a peace plank in the party platform. And Lyndon Johnson said no. I mean, he, he, he was not at that convention. But the, for, from Washington, from the Oval Office, no. A peace plank is a complete repudiation of me. And he took it personally, as he ought to. It is a complete repudiation of me as a wartime president. And the peace plank was voted down. But the commotion, the rioting in the street, the, the commotion on the floor of the convention, Richard Nixon watching this, Richard Nixon was shrewd, smart, and a detailed guy. Whatever, you, whatever your politics are, he was shrewd, he was smart, and he was a detailed guy. And he got himself in big trouble because he didn't follow his instincts. More about that some other night, some other afternoon. And watching that convention, and this became one of the staples of his, of his speechifying across the country. It's a great line. It's a great line. Do you want the line? Do you want the line? Sure you do. You can write it down. If Hubert Humphrey cannot run a convention, how can he run the country? And you, and you remember watching that convention. I mean, it spilled into our living rooms, didn't it? Completely unedited. Let me say it again, it's beautiful. That if Hubert Humphrey cannot run a convention, how can he run the country? Case closed. 
absolutely case closed. At least as Richard Nixon pulled out of Miami with, with already in his pocket a 15 point lead in the polls. And with Spiro Agnew and, and Richard Nixon developing a, the, the themes that he would work from September through to election day. And one theme was that I, I appeal to the silent majority. I do not appeal to the shouters and the protesters. That I appeal to those people who pay their taxes, go to church, stay married, work for a living. That's who I appeal to. You know, middle America, you know, the silent majority. That's who I appeal to. Not the shouters. Not the shouters. And I have a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. And I'm not going to politicize that war because peace talks had already begun. And Nixon, very shrewdly in a very smart way, that I, I have a secret plan to end the war. He did not. It was so secret even he didn't know about it. But here's, here's how shrewd he is, that I'm not going to politicize the peace talks. If peace can be had before this election, that's a good thing. And I'm not going to interfere with that at all by, by saying, on a Nixon watch, this is my plan. Let peace be had. Let the dying and the bleeding stop. That's perfect. There was no plan. But there doesn't have to be a plan. He, he, he didn't make it illegitimate. He simply said, I'm not getting in the way of these peace talks. If elected, I may go to Paris where those peace talks are being held and, 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 and begin to straighten it out, but I'm not going to say a word about it. What I will say a word about is that we need law and order justices on the Supreme Court. That we have a Supreme Court under Earl Warren that has given a green light to, 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 to criminals. That we need a court, we need a country where the, where the rights of, def, of, of victims are more important than the rights of defendants. We need law and order. And, and, and the first right of every American is to be safe in their home. The first right of every American is to be able to walk a mile or a mile and a half from the home and not be, and not be fearful of being mugged or attacked. And for the women as well, more importantly. The first right is the right to be safe. We need a tougher court. And we need to get these kids back on, back in campus. We need law and order. And we need to shut down you know, the Black Panthers and Bobby Seale and burn baby burn and don't trust anyone over 30. It is time to take charge here. Whew, I'm exhausted already. It is time to straighten this mess out. And I have, I'm the man, I have the plan, and, I, and here's the opportunity. I'm a new Nixon. I've traveled, I've read, I've thought, and I'm throwing my hat back in the ring. It's in my blood. It really was. I mean, in his gut, Richard Nixon wanted to be President of the United States. Hubert Humphrey, nice guy. Nice guy. And his wife Muriel, a lovely woman. Hubert Humphrey did not enter a single primary. He was seen by the, by the left. He was seen by the, uh, you know, the anti-war movement. He was seen by many moderate delegates of the convention as more of a vote for Hubert Humphrey is a vote for Lyndon Johnson. A vote for Hubert Humphrey is a vote for more war. A vote for Hubert Humphrey is a vote for more turmoil in the streets. A vote for Hubert Humphrey is a vote for more turmoil on the campuses. And he's the party of the establishment. And he was. I mean, he came into that Chicago convention, you know, with a bushel basket full of de delegates who the party bosses had earmarked for him. Into Chicago came Gene McCarthy with 200 plus delegates. Robert Kennedy, if he had made it to Chicago, had almost 400 delegates. And of course that begs the question, you know, whether or not if Robert Kennedy had made it to Chicago, uh, you know, whether or not he would have been able to swipe the, the nomination from, from Hubert Humphrey, I doubt it. Even though Lyndon Johnson had absented himself from the election and was not at the convention, he was still on the phone. And he, he, can, he in many ways, was able to still, if he needed to, you know, to micromanage the, the Democratic Party on the floor at Chicago. I mean, Hubert Humphrey 
had pitched Lyndon Johnson, let's move the convention to Florida, to Miami, we, that it'll be a safer place. We can control access. Chicago's wide open. And Lyndon Johnson said, Hubert, no. I promised Mayor Daley the convention. Delegates will come and spend money. You know, it's a good vitamin shop for the, for the economy of downtown Chicago. Lyndon Johnson tortured Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey was a good guy, and his politics were moderate, progressive moderate. And as Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson privately, that Richard Nixon would be a better president, he's tougher, and he's sharper. You know, he's willing to make the tough decision and crack a skull if he needs to. He'd make a, he'd make a better president. Hubert Humphrey's too soft, he said he's too weak. He has, he has what he called the Minnesota disease. He never knows when to stop talking. He goes on and on and on and on. You get up, make your pitch, and you sit down. And you let the voter decide. So Hubert Humphrey is seen as the party, as the candidate of the establishment. More war, more Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson tortured Hubert Humphrey to the point of, ready for this? He did not officially, at the top of his voice, endorse Hubert Humphrey until three days before the election in Texas with Lady Bird there and Muriel and Hubert to endorse him three days before the election. Uh, that's painful. And for Hubert Humphrey, he was tortured, tortured by Lyndon Johnson. And when Hubert Humphrey accepted the nomination, and it was such a divided party, and, and again, just revisit, go to YouTube and revisit those scenes of those police officers, you know, beating the protesters, you know, and dragging them off and throwing them, you know, into the, into the vans. I mean, everybody, those clubs were out, the, those cuffs were out. And it looked as if, by the way, the way, the, the way it was reported, boy, the press sometimes doesn't do its job, and, and, and they don't. The, the, they really are not doing their job now. The way that the, it looked as if, the way they cropped the cameras, that the, everyone under 30 was in Chicago in the streets, the Battle of Michigan Avenue. There were about 10,000 protesters. But the way it was filmed, the way it was cropped, it looked as if the nation had flooded into Chicago. There were 10 cops for every protester. And, and it, it is, it, and it was a police riot. And Dick Daly, Mayor Daley did not want any marches, did not want any, any overnight permits in Lincoln Park. In April of that year, in the aftermath of King's assassination, 20 blocks of downtown Chicago had been burned to the ground. I don't want this here. I don't want this trouble. I want the convention. I do not want the anti-war movement. And that's why those cops were told, stop it in its tracks. Do not let them cross Michigan Avenue and try to force their way into the convention. And that led to, if he cannot govern or run a convention, how can he run the country? Ed Muskie, boy, he makes your blood run hot, huh? Ed Muskie, the uh, vice presidential nominee. And Hubert Humphrey's bolder, his bolder advisors at the convention advised him, recommended to him, I'm looking for a podium, we don't have it. This will work. That Hubert, no, Mr. Vice President, you need to separate yourself from President Johnson. You need to tell the country, to show the country, to explain to the country what a Humphrey presidency would look like. You need to sell yourself. You need to market yourself. What would a Humphrey presidency look like? And Hubert's listening. And what are you suggesting? We're suggesting, Mr. Vice President, that in the last paragraph of your acceptance speech, that you resign from the Vice Presidency. I can't do that. He just did not have the, you can fill in the blank, you're all big boys and girls. There's no way that I can resign from the Presidency. Tonight, Lyndon Johnson's head will blow off his neck. He'll screw it back on. 
he'll jump on Air Force One, he'll be at O'Hare Airport and be here 30 minutes later, punch me in the nose and announce that I want the nomination. I can't do that. And the best Humphrey could do, or could bring himself to do, is that when he spoke during the election and spoke behind a podium, that he removed the vice presidential seal. So that's a symbolic separation. And for, and for his more aggressive and bolder advisors, you need to separate. You need to divorce Lyndon Johnson tonight. Serve him papers. You are done. Hubert Humphrey could not do it. I think it would have won on the election. It, it would have changed, I think, the whole dynamic of the election. It's a bold thing to do. And Lyndon Johnson was a bear. Lyndon Johnson, he tortured people. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was a bully. And he could be a bully and a lover in the same paragraph. And I'll just leave it at that. A very complicated and conflicted man. We'll never see the likes of a Lyndon Johnson again. The system doesn't allow it any longer. And the great gifts of the, of the, of the great society, uh, I mean, they're out there. The Civil Rights Legislation, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the Appalachian, so I said, you know, the, the Appalachian Trail Act, and went on and on and on. Prenatal care, postnatal care, A to elementary, secondary, collegiate education. I mean, it was a cafeteria table of programs. And to help yourself, help yourself. I'm LBJ. We are the most affluent country in the world, and we can afford a war on poverty at home and a war in Vietnam. It destroyed him, absolutely destroyed him. Some observers believed he had a nervous breakdown, and Robert McNamara as well. McNamara did, no doubt about that. Whether or not LBJ did is a matter of speculation. So Hubert Humphrey's out there on the campaign trail, and Nixon, law and order, I have a plan to end the Vietnam War. You know, we need, a, we need a, a federal court system and a Supreme Court that does not give a green light to criminals. That's his phrase, a green light to criminals. The, the Miranda rights, if the cops arrest you, they have a reason for arresting you. To have an attorney present when you're being questioned, humbug, humbug, humbug. That you pay for your own attorney. Come on, tighten it. Let's not be soft here. We've got a crime wave going on. And take care of business, law and order. We need good, tough judges that take care of business and aren't afraid. And can dine at a restaurant they want, at, they want to without being harassed by the Gestapo left. That's an editorial comment. The, as the election day approached, the Nixon people fear. Are you familiar with this phrase? A, an October surprise? We, that something will happen. I'm gonna tip over, I'm gonna trip over this chair. And that's all that you will remember. Uh, that's all that you'll remember. Were you there when Highlander went ass over tea kettle? Were you there? And the way he sprang up like he meant to do it? Huh? Doesn't it happen right? You know, sometimes you walk into a door, you think it's open, so I meant to do that. Or you get out of the car and you stumble and you're down on your knees. I meant to do that. <laughs> How about this? Talking about I meant to do it. You know you're getting a little bit older or lying in the tooth when you walk into a room and you cannot remember why you walked into the room? Come on, let's have a show of hands here. Thank you. And how do you fix that? You walk back out, don't you? And then you walk back in and hope something will click. We're all there. It's called maturity, <laughs> all right? That's what it's called, it's called maturity. It's, you're no longer a Toys R Us kid because there's no longer a Toys R Us. You cannot be a Toys R Us kid. The Nixon people fear the October surprise. Something will happen on the very eve of the election. Something will happen that will push Hubert Humphrey over the finish line or drag Hubert Humphrey over the finish line. And they feared it would be an announcement from Paris that peace is at hand. And that announcement was just about to be made. And the person who tipped off John Mitchell, uh, John Mitchell chaired the, uh, the Nixon re-election campaign in both elections. John Mitchell received a phone call from Henry Kissinger. Now, 
Henry Kissinger had no use for Richard Nixon. He referred to Richard Nixon as a first-rate, third-rate. But let me tell you what Henry Kissinger wanted. He wanted power. He wanted to be on the cover of Time magazine. He wanted to shape and formulate American foreign policy. He wanted to take it like, like, a, like clay and remodel it and reshape it in his image and likeness. But I can only do that if I have the ear of a president. And, and, he, and he had, Henry Kissinger, had always worked for Nelson Rockefeller, had been his foreign policy advisor. You know, but old Rocky, you know, wasn't able to get the nomination in 60, 64, or 68. And, and Humphrey, or rather, Kissinger, Nixon is a first-rate, third-rate. So I'm going to offer my expertise to Humphrey. And, and maybe if lightning strikes and Humphrey wins, that I'll be his national security advisor. See, what Kissinger is about to do, he's about to betray Hubert Humphrey. He's about to derail the peace process so that he can be a national security advisor and show John Mitchell how tough I am and how ruthless I can be. I want the power. I want the position. I want to be the last man the president speaks to in the evening and the first man in the morning. I want power. And I'll cut everybody, anybody's throat. He was a loner. He was a loner. He was vicious. And that phone call was made to John Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, Henry Kissinger here. Henry! John Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell, there's an October surprise coming. I'm working in Paris with the Democrats. Avril Harriman, the lead negotiator, has just said we're about to pop the, the, the cork on the ball of champagne. Peace is at hand, a ceasefire. Uh, peace is coming. And your candidate, and this happens all the time, that elections, the polls close, don't they? I mean, they, they don't close, but the poll numbers begin to even up. It always happens. So Richard Nixon, coming out of Miami in the summer of 1968, that those numbers, that, that huge 15-point lead, had begun to shrink a little bit. It wasn't at the point where it's too close to call, but something could happen to push or pull Hubert Humphrey over the finish line. And it's coming, John Mitchell. It's coming. But I have something else to share with you. And we never had this conversation. Don't you like to have those conversations with people? You know, we've never had this conversation. And the best place to have those conversations is not in your office or not in the cafeteria. Let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk from point A to B, out of earshot. We never had this conversation. But I have something you need to know. And I want you to remember where it came from. President Tu has the right to veto any peace proposal. If he's uncomfortable with it, he has the right to say no, yet, without any reason. And if you're willing to tell or have the word passed to President Tu that in a Nixon presidency, You'll get a better deal than the deal on the table now. You'll get a better deal. And what truly bothered, well, you'll get a better deal. And one of, the, one of the very bothersome deals that was on the table at that time is that it was going to be an in-place ceasefire, which means that there would be a ceasefire, but the enemy, you know, would be allowed to remain in place, in position, in South Vietnam, you know, rather than having to withdraw. We never had this conversation. But I'm telling you, on the QT, that President Tu, if he says no, it's no. There's your opening. There's your opening. And for Mitchell, to Nixon, to Haldeman, to Ehrlichman, how do we play this? How do we play this? How do we throw, as Haldeman wrote in his legal notepad, he, he always worked off a legal notepad. I like, I really, I, that's how I work. I like working off, I work, I like to write on, a, on that big legal notepad. We need to throw a monkey wrench into this. How do we throw a monkey wrench into this? We're going to make a phone call to Anna Chenault. Remember the Flying Tigers from World War II? Anna Chenault was married to one of the 
pilots and one of the founders of the Flying Tigers. She was an Asia firster. She was the China lobby. And she had a direct line to President Tu. Tell Mrs. Chenault from President, we can't make that call. Tell her to tell President Tu you're gonna give it, you're gonna get a better deal on the Nixon watch. And also make a call to the, the, the South Vietnamese ambassador to the United States. Get the phone call on the President too. Say no, you get a better deal. So there was a no. Uh, there was no October surprise. So here we have Henry Kissinger meddling in American foreign policy, which is a violation of the Logan Act, which is a felony, which goes all the way back to John Adams and the, uh, and, and, and the whole problem with, with, with France. And we, have, and we have Kissinger selling Hubert Humphrey out selling the American people out. And truth to tell, truth to tell, since there was no secret plan, uh, 21,000 more American servicemen died on the Nixon watch, about 30,000 plus on the Lyndon Johnson watch, 20,000 plus on the Nixon watch. There was no secret plan. And when the end, end, game, came, end, game, ca end game came in 1973 in Vietnam, President Tu was told, Sign. You have no veto right. We are leaving. You have no option. Sign. And it is an in place ceasefire. So that lesson was learned, wasn't it? We're not giving the president of South Vietnam an opportunity to nix the deal. Now, as, as election day came and the votes began to come in across the country, uh, Walter Cronkite, who was always there, wasn't he? I mean, Walter Cronkite. Uh, we've talked, I think, a little bit about Walter Cronkite. That you know, Walter Cronkite was so believable, wasn't he? That he had such credibility. And there's no one like Walter today. And and all Cronkite had to do was look into the camera, and look puzzled and bewildered, and bounce those eyebrows up and down. And he could move poll numbers three or four points, couldn't he? And it would be Walter Cronkite. Uh, speaking to the country, it's too close to call. The election's too close to call. The election will be called the day, the morning after. And, and Richard Nixon will win by a little over popular vote, a little over 500,000 votes. It was 0.7 tenths of a percent in terms of the popular vote between Nixon and Humphrey. I haven't mentioned Wallace yet. Let's drop Wallace in. Henry Wallace and General Curtis LeMay, the head of the air campaign over Japan. Wallace, the American Independent Party, appealed to the same reservoir of resentment as Nixon did. You know, the, uh, the shouters, the protesters. You know, we need to, you know, we need to tighten up here. And Wallace was a great showman. See, Wallace knew how to work a crowd, and the angry the crowd was, the better he liked it. And he would, he would just, he was a, he was a prize fighter, a band, you know, a, a lightweight. But he was a prize fighter. And he'd square his shoulders and said, I hear your love. Ah, ah, George, George Wallace welcomes your love. And they're, and they're giving him those F bombs everywhere and Zeke Kyle, Zeke Kyle, Zeke Kyle. Look at the video. And, and they're giving him these F bombs. He said, I've got two four letter words for you. If you all be quiet and shut up and hear them, I got two four letter words for you soap and work. That's great, isn't it? Uh, get a job, cut your hair, grow up, be responsible, soap and work. For a while, it looked as if Wallace was going to pull down enough electoral votes to throw the election to the House of Representatives. He came to Boston and got a huge reception, huge reception. But as with most third, all third party movements, as the election day closes, flirting with a third party, becomes less attractive. And, and Wallace wound up with 13.5% of the popular vote. And he earned 36 electoral votes. Nixon, Walter Cronkite declares Nixon the winner the following morning with 301 electoral votes that uh, the Richard Nixon is the next president of the United States. Hubert Humphrey tallied 191. As I said, Wallace had 46. I mean, it was a tumultuous election. And debates, Hubert Humphrey wanted to debate 
Nixon. And Nixon wanted no part of that because he knew what had happened in 1960. And Eisenhower had warned me not to debate Jack Kennedy. Dick, nobody knows Jack Kennedy. He's nobody from nowhere. He's a backbencher from Massachusetts. Nobody can understand what he says. Uh, he talks funny. Don't debate him. He needs it. You don't. And Nixon, I can debate this guy. I'll destroy him. And we know, we know that those debates turned the election, moved those polls, didn't they? And closed the gap between Nixon and Kennedy. People who watched the debate watched it and saw Nixon melt away with the, uh, with the lazy shave. People who viewed it, that Kennedy won that debate. I know I don't like to speak in terms of winning or losing. And Nixon debated. What Kennedy did, he introduced him to the country, himself to the country. I'm a Catholic, you know, and this is 1960. Vote your future, not your fear, not your fears. You know, vote, vote, vote your, you know, don't vote your prejudice. Vote, vote the future, don't vote your fear. I happen to be, I happen to be the, the nominee of the Democratic Party. I am the nominee of the Democratic Party who happens to be Catholic. And I will never put the Bible in front of the Constitution. I will never put the need, the, the, the concerns of the Vatican before the concerns of the American people. He won that site debate. People who listened to the debate that Nixon, because he debated. And if you've ever been on a debating team, you know that you lay it out, don't you? Boom. Anybody ever on a debating team? You lay it out. You have your points. You, you, it's check and checkmate. And you, have, and you have people who know what they're listening to scoring, scoring the debate. You know, it's like the tennis match. You know, where's the ball landing? What's in? What's out? Did you tip the net? Whatever. Did you smash your racket? I'm not debating Humphrey. I will, and, and Humphrey trying to smoke Nixon out, referring to him as, and this comes right out of the Middle Ages, referring to Richard the chicken hearted, you know, Richard the silent, he won't debate me. What Nixon did, and this is, and this is worth reading today, the selling of a president and, and controlling the medium controlling the event, controlling the outcome. Joe McGinnis selling a president. And he worked for a time on the Nixon team until they found out he was looking to write a book, you know, as how they control the use of television. Nixon knew the power of television, and he knew it from the checker speech. But you see, he had controlled the message, the tone, the visual of the checker speech. He wasn't able to control the debates, the four debates with Kennedy. But Nixon, it was called Nixon, Nixon Answers. And it was a series of, that he would address a room full of questioners in an amphitheater. It was all very nicely controlled. We very carefully select who's there. No protesters. Nobody's gonna shout, stand up and shout four letter words at me. We screen them. We've got security. We control the camera. And I'm the man in the arena. He used that from Theodore Roosevelt. I'm the man in the arena. And I'm standing in front of you without benefit of a podium, without benefit of a stand-up microphone to take your questions and to answer them fully and fairly. I am the man in the arena with the red cape, and I'll take any question. The cape, the cape, the cape. Very carefully controlled, no trouble, and it was so locked up. And he was good. He was good. The new Nixon. The only problem, if you look at the original tape, sometimes they would, get, they would get reactions of the family. And Pat Nixon, boy, did she suffer being married to that guy. And she'd be nodding off. And the cameras would catch her nodding off. I said, get, get that camera off her. And suddenly, bang, she's gone. And we go to somebody waving and, and glowing and smiling. Good stuff, isn't it? Nancy Reagan never nodded off, did she? Her, she never took her eyes off Ronnie. It was as if I'd never seen him so brilliant, so well-spoken. She'd heard it a million times, but she's an actress. He's an actor. I know how to deliver a line. I know how to act as a candidate's wife. I'm good at that. And I know where the camera is. And I know my best angle. It's politics. It's TV. 
Nixon knew the power of television. I'm not debating him, I'm controlling the camera. I controlled it at the Checker speech, and I saved my position on the ticket with Eisenhower with that speech to the country in 1952. So there we have it. You know, a little bit of a trip down memory lane. We got a lot done, didn't we? You know, and Phil impinged on my time. And, but we got a lot done. We got a little bit of the war in, the Great Society in, LBJ, and, and, and an, election that, an election that had consequences. All elections have consequences, don't they? And, and some of them are certainly unexpected, unintended, and we're not prepared for. So I'm going to put a period right here. But you may have a question, a memory. Anybody here at this table? Clean for Gene? Anybody here? Clean for Gene? Any guys? Clean for Gene. Clean for Gene. You went to New Hampshire? Did you cut your hair? Of course you did. You still do. I wish I had hair to cut. Phil has hair to cut. All right. Pardon me? I had some cut today. There you go. I noticed. When's the last right? I know. That's why we get along. I noticed that. This is really my younger brother. <laughs> in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> so I will, are we meeting again anytime soon? Well, we have, yes, we have 2019 all booked. Do we have anything for the well, rest of the year? something in December. I think it's on a Friday morning. Something in December? I think so. You're going to gift me with something in December, right? I already this gifted is, you. This is Secret I Santa? Gifted you We're going to have a Secret Santa. I already gifted you something. Yeah, but I'm greedy. I want more. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm never satisfied. Uh -huh. uh, want, want, want. I'll see you all later. Yeah. Be well. Be well. Thank you. Bill, over to you. watching Medfield TV Community Shows.